Great. Good morning, everyone. I am Poe Frat, and I'm the senior analyst at Noble Capital Markets covering the transportation industry in addition to a couple other industrial indus industries. With us today on the transportation panel is our four executives from companies that we cover. Uh, most of these companies are involved in the dry bulk uh, shipping market, uh, but we do have um, Eurocees also uh, represented from Eurocees who is involved in the container market. What I'd like to start with is just give um, each of our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves and then also give a short advertisement for their, their companies and the asset base that they operate. Um, with that, Stamatis, would you start please? Of course. Good morning everyone. Uh, Paul, thank you for organizing this uh, panel today. It's uh, always a pleasure to attend uh, Nobles conferences. Uh, my name is Stamatis Santanis. I am the chairman and CEO of uh, Synergy Maritime Holdings. Um, we own and operate a fleet of uh, 11 Cape Size vessels. Um, the Cape Size vessels are basically the largest conventional size of the dry bulk uh, industry and we transport mainly iron ore and coal. Um, iron ore and coal are fundamental uh, raw materials for the infrastructure demand uh, and all the infrastructure development that is actually happening in many parts of the world. Um, we have a homogeneous fleet of 11 Cape size ships of high quality vessels, uh, which we have bought the last five years at what we believe to be, um, you know, one of the lowest uh, parts of the shipping cycle. For 2020, for last year, the first half of the year was very bad for dry bulk and even worse uh, for the Cape sizes uh, altogether because of uh, the collapse uh, in demand, uh, which is attributed mainly from uh, seasonal regions uh, from Brazil and especially uh, the pandemic uh, global slowdown that occurred uh, with the COVID-19. Uh, from the second half of uh, 2020 onwards, the demand has picked up substantially as well as the supply of the cargoes that we transport. And therefore, we're now going through a very substantial increase of um, the freight rate environment. Uh, we're still quite below from the long-term averages um, and what we are comfortable uh, for the future. But right now, um, the, the year in 2021 has started at one of the highest levels of the last 10 years. Our industry is now trading at around $25,000 a day, which is the day spot rate of a Cape size vessel. And the, um, uh, the, the actual outlook for 2021 appears to be very advantageous uh, for our sector. That being said, we will have the opportunity to discuss uh, in depth um, further in today's panel. Uh, that's a brief introduction as far as Synergy is concerned. And uh, back to you, Paul. Great. And the symbol for Synergy is S-H-I-P. Yes. Uh, with that, thank you, Stamanis. Uh, Mads Peterson, would you um, tell us about Pangea Logistics, please? Sure. Thank you very much, Poe, for the opportunity to be on the panel today. Yes, uh, my name is Mads Peterson. I'm here today representing uh, Pangea Logistics Solutions. We are a um, dry park logistics provider uh, and owner and operator of um, ships primarily in the uh, Supramax and Panamax uh, segments. Uh, unlike uh, some of my um, esteemed uh, uh, colleagues on the panel today, we are not uh, exclusively focused on, on, the, on, the, on the owning of the steel, of the assets, but also becoming uh, more integrated in our customers' uh, supply chain, um, thereby providing uh, services in niche markets. Um, and, and those are primarily operation of ice class tonnage, it is uh, logistics uh, projects and it is um, stevedoring uh, business. So in addition to our dry bar ships, we also own uh, barges and uh, cranes. So instead of just providing transportation solutions from A to B, we become a bigger part or we aim to become a bigger part of our customers' supply chain, offering more comprehensive services uh, that uh, generates in uh, premium earnings. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Gary Gary Vogel of Eagle Bolt Shipping, would you uh, please tell us about Eagle? Yes, thank you, Poe, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Vogel. I'm the CEO of Eagle Bolt Shipping. We're uh, listed on NASDAQ under the ticker ETLE. We are owner, an owner-operator of 
48 um, Supermax and Ultramax mid-sized dry bulk vessels. We also have, uh, of the 48 vessels, uh, including two that have yet to be delivered to us that we've recently announced acquisition of, 92% uh, of the fleet is, are fitted with exhaust gas cleaning systems, more commonly referred to as scrubbers. And uh, we operate from a headquarters in Stamford, Connecticut, with offices in Europe and Singapore. And the active management strategy is very much a part of our um, our, our business methodology and value proposition with a goal and a track record of outperforming the benchmark Baltic Supermax indices. Thank you, Paul. Great. And Tassos, would you uh, let us know about Euroseas and EuroDry, please? Good morning, everybody. Paul, thank you very much, you and Noble, for organizing uh, this conference and inviting us. I'm Tassos Aslidis. I'm the CFO of Eurosys Limited, a container ship owner and operator, and EuroDry Limited, a dry bulk owner and operator. Uh, Eurosys has accessed the capital markets back in 2005 and 2007, listed on NASDAQ, initially owning both container ships and dry bulk vessels. It represents the shipping interest of one of the oldest families in Greek shipping, the Pitas family, that traces its roots all the way back to the end of the 19th century, 150 years ago. We have uh, followed the markets over the last 15 years in the public sector. Uh, as I said in the beginning, initially in investing in both dry bulk and container ships. Three years ago, we realized, we figured that the uh, better in investment model for our shareholders was to separate our fleets and have them choose which of the two segments they want to, to invest. So we spun out Eurodry Limited, a company that owns Panamax, Camsomax, and Ultramax size vessels. We own seven dry bulk vessels. Eurosys was left with our container ships and became the, I believe, one of the few, if not the only, publicly listed container owner focused on feeder and intermediate size container ships. Last year and last gate in general were one of the most difficult in shipping, but we have managed to sail them through. And now we expect to capitalize on the hopefully turning fortunes of, uh, of both sectors. Great. Thank you, Tassos. And I should have mentioned that Pangea Logistics Solutions trades under the symbol of PANL. Um, with that, I mean, since there's uh, not that much overlap between each of you or between each of the companies, I was hoping to sort of walk around the, <clears throat> or walk through the different segments of the market. And if you can give us an idea of what you're currently seeing on the demand front, um, let's start with demand first and, and then maybe also, you know, start with, you know, how, how challenging was last year just because of some of the curveballs that were thrown to you and, um, and then just how the 2021, uh, you know, is, is sort of looking at this point in time. Uh, Stamatis, would you start with the Cape market? Of course. Thank you. Well, like I mentioned before, uh, Cape size vessels uh, transport mainly iron ore and coal. Uh, this is um, basically a 2 billion ton a year transportation, um, transportation of raw materials. It's about 1.2 billion tons a year, which is the iron ore, and around 800 million tons, which is uh, the coal. Uh, coal is then, again, divided into two main categories thermal coal and that's metallurgical coal which is used for the production of steel. What happened in 2020 was basically we had the, the initial demand shock come steel uh, production. Uh, when we initially had the demand shock from China that recovered quite quickly because you know the COVID situation in China uh, was I'm not going to say rectified, but was normalized, um, you know, within four or five weeks. So the disruptions in production was not so uh, important. Uh, the problem is, uh, especially with iron ore, is that it's being produced in uh, two and a half <laughs> main countries, main production areas in the world, and that's uh, Brazil, uh, Australia, and then half uh, location is uh, here and there in various other places. We had a very severe supply disruption of the cargo uh, from Brazil last year due to weather and other um, local issues. And that has decreased the export uh, levels of 
the iron ore from Brazil to China substantially. And when I say substantially, I mean uh, the last year's exports out of Brazil, which is a fundamental trade, Brazil to China, not only from a ton mile, but also from the importance of the cargo itself, uh, that affected the dry bulk market uh, very, very significantly. We saw rates uh, down to zero dollars a day last year, and that was a very detrimental period uh, for all of us. Uh, asset values went down, the freight levels you know, went down, and you know, it, it was a very bad case. However, the production of iron ore and the export levels started to normalize again, and that was, like I said before, not so much related to the COVID situation, but it was uh, domestic in, in Brazil. That has normalized a lot. But also, this, um, the second half of the year, and especially in Q4, uh, we have seen a big increase in the transportation of coal, again, that has become another important commodity for transportation. So the combination of a normalized iron ore and the coal production and exports uh, from various places in the world, mainly to China, has driven the rates to one of the highest levels uh, as far as Q1 is concerned over the last 10 years. We believe that uh, the healthy demand, uh, which is uh, mainly for the production of steel, uh, that is going to happen from 2021 onwards, uh, is going to be very beneficial for the Cape size segment. And we are also very optimistic that the Cape size rates will reach what we think are a normalized um, long-term average, which is exceeding the $20,000 to $25,000 a day uh, on, a, on a full year basis. This is what we think is going to happen. And the reason for the demand is, as you know, when the global economies are exiting uh, this kind of, um, you know, historical uh, pandemic events, one of uh, the main, um, uh, how do you say it, one of the main investments that are happening from the countries is infrastructure. So when you have this infrastructure um, investments that will happen, mainly driven by the global stimuli, as far as other fundamental reasons, we strongly believe that the demand for iron ore and coal will remain very strong in the next years to come. And that's what makes us quite optimistic for the Cape size trade. That's very quickly from my end. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Stamatis. And, and uh, Mats, why don't we move over to you and, and have you talk about the ice class market and the, the Panamax market? Sure, sure. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think, you know, compared to the Cape size, of course, uh, the, the fleets uh, that we employ in, in Pangea carry a more sort of a, a very cargo mix. But while, of course, still um, iron ore and coal makes up a large part, especially on, on our Panamax sizes. But um, last year, were, for the first, uh, first half at least, was for sure challenging. And I think many people tend to forget that even before uh, COVID started to make an impact in um, in the Atlantic markets, uh, you know, markets were, were, were pretty brutal, actually. But, um, you know, I think we have a pretty resilient business uh, in the sense that, 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 as I mentioned before, we are engaged in these trades. So we have, um, you know, operate, we operate in markets where there are considerable barriers to entry and, and, and with a more sort of wider service um, that we provide to our customers that, that, that proved to be really beneficial in a, in a challenging um, a challenging year like last year. But by far the biggest challenge that, that our operation had was uh, the very, very unfortunate situation around our seafarers where it became increasingly difficult to um, get a crew uh, home after having served their contracts and getting new crew on board. Um, that, that was uh, a major a challenge for us through the year, which I, which I think we, we actually managed um, uh, quite successfully. But um, you know, our business pretty quickly adjusted to sort of the new normal um, that, that, that we continue to operate in. And the underlying sort of uh, supply demand drivers, I, I think, are, are pretty favorable. Look, we are, I think, uh, maybe with the exception of our eternally optimistic uh, Greek colleagues here, I think we find ourselves in a, uh, in, a more, uh, in, a, in a much better market than we thought we would be at this time. So, uh, you know, if anything, it just goes to show that the volatility is there. It's, it's becoming increasingly um, unpredictable in the short term, at least. But we are uh, bullish on the, on the sort of longer fundamentals in terms of the, especially the new supply coming into the market um, in terms of new ships. And we made moves accordingly last year, trying to, um, to take advantage of, of, uh, of, of a downward point in the cycle by increasing our 
exposure in our niche businesses. So rather than going out and buying a lot of uh, standard, uh, standard vessels, we increased our, our ownership in, 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 in our niches by uh, both through um, various uh, projects or into business, but also in our ice class fleet, which, um, you know, once again last year proved that, you know, there is a room for, for specialized uh, operations, even though the ships are um, sort of based on a standard design, we were able to extract a, a pretty significant market all through the year. And of course, also taking advantage of the, 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 the pretty high spot market at the end of last year and even as of today. So, you know, we, um, we like to say we, we also know what we don't know and sort of short you know, predictions are, are always hard, especially in shipping. But we really like the way we're positioned now, ready to take advantage of, um, of whatever the market offers us. So, um, but I, I share uh, as the Marty's optimism. Great, thank you, Gary. Would you um, would you t discuss the super and ultra rex market sectors for us? Sure, thanks, Paul. Um, so, so you know, uh, similar as we operate uh, not just in the major bolts coal, iron, or in grain, but, but also in all the minor bolts, a much more diverse cargo pattern. And it gives us the ability to, you know, triangulate and, and operate our, our ships, what we believe, in a more efficient manner. Notwithstanding that, we're all um, subject to the overall, you know, fundamental markets. And last year, it's interesting, even before COVID made its way in, in, in any meaningful way to to the United States and Europe, and this time last year, the Supermax index was at $6,000 a day. And, and it was really, I believe the main driver was a lack of this long haul soybean trade, which this year, for a number of reasons, including the phase one trade deal, we had a, a strong Q4, strong start to the marketing year for soybean exports from the US, and that supported the market. And now we have some, you know, uh, we, we have a fairly robust cold trade overall because of uh, the, the cold weather. So we're starting with some tailwinds, which is something we haven't had for quite some time. Uh, uh, and, and it's nice to see that, that they go both directions, these, these uh, vagaries, if you will. So, you know, last year, dry bulk overall, um, there was 3% contraction. Uh, dry bulk has actually only had contraction two times in the last 20 years. Once was the year of the financial crisis, and it snapped back uh, dramatically the following year and and the second was last year based on COVID and expectation uh, based on the the data we use is is dry bulk growth of four percent and so you know we're, we're also optimistic but the optimism comes you know it, you, you can't talk about demand and shipping without supply because in an industry that's had demand growth in every single year except for two we've had challenging markets it's because of oversupply because of the ordering of too many ships and now through, for a number of reasons, and, and you know, I, I, unfortunately, I don't think I can credit the um, restraint of, of owners across the world, but, but because of a number of reasons like more expensive capital, a challenging market, uncertainty about future carbon emissions and regulations, we find ourselves really in a 25-year historic low on the supply side, where, where, where the, the order book as a percentage of the on-the-water fleet is just over 6%, and in the mid-size segment, it's actually just over 5 So So with an expectation of, of net supply and dry bulk of less than 2% this year and dry bulk demand of 4%, that's the, to me, that's the constructive, right? It's that, it's that outpacing of demand to supply that makes us optimistic and why we sit here today, partly why we sit here today where futures have traded up significantly over the past number of months with a realization that that demand outstripping supply should bode well for rate development going forward. Great. Thank you, Gary. Um, Tassos, uh, you know, if you would like to, to add any comments to the sectors and the dry bulk market that you, that, you know, Euro, Euro dry operates in, but more importantly, maybe give us an overview of what you're seeing in the feeder container market and you know, the sectors you operate in the container market. Thank you, Paul. I don't have much to add on the on the dry bulk side. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Gary, and I think we'll talk a little bit more uh, later on on the, uh, the, the question. Is, the equation is really has two sides, both demand and supply. But let me offer a few comments and characterize the container uh, containerized trade demand, uh, which has been on the, on the correction on an expected correction trend over the last decade after experiencing 
a very significant annual growth rate back in the 2000s, especially fueled by the China's incorporation in the world trade uh, system. Um, in, in the, over the last decade, demand has naturally declined, and demand growth rate has naturally declined, uh, but it was significantly positive. Um, th that has uh, uh, continued with ups and downs uh, each year, depending on the world economy. Uh, during the end of last year, we had uh, the, we saw the first signs of uh, a looming slowdown, which uh, obviously intensified in the first half of uh, 2020. Uh, but very quickly, um, I would say, and somewhat surprisingly, by early summer, we have seen uh, signs of uh, the market and, and demand recovery in the containerized trade sector. I think uh, now we are looking, uh, looking together at uh, last year and the coming year, we expect uh, to summarize the uh, past uh, trends and the uh, future expectation as we have lost a year between the two in terms of demand growth. Uh, since the market has recovered uh, noticeably uh, over the last year and uh, since supply, as we'll discuss, is also in this segment at a relatively low uh, point, historically low point, we expect to see even with modest demand growth from now on, although it's expected to be in the order of four to five percent, we expect to see a pretty good uh, tailwinds uh, for, for the sector. In addition to the trade demand and the trade movements, there are additional factors that affect this supply demand uh, equation that you can decide whether to add them on the demand or the supply side. Right now, there is a fair amount of congestion at various ports around the world. Uh, many ships are tied up. There's congestion and delays, I understand, cr crossing the Panama Canal. So all these reduce the effective supply, or in other words, increase the demand for, for ships and uh, um, help the market maintain health levels. Perhaps these additional factors will reverse itself, themselves as trade uh, flows rationalize or and uh, work themselves out over the year, but overall, I think we are in a good point, in a very good point in the containers sector. Great, thank you. You, um, Tassos, you alluded to one, you know, factors that, and I guess a um, couple other um, members of the panel mentioned it. We're, you know, we're at a higher level going into the year than we ever have been. And we typically first quarter, second quarter have seasonality. Do you think this year is something different uh, from you know what we've traditionally seen in the market, where seasonality is a major factor in the first half of the year, and then you see a second half pickup? Could it be a little bit more even over the course of the year? Said, so would anyone like to predict sort of you know what's going to happen um, over the next six months or so as as some of these potential factors like congestion or or you know the benefit of, of trade you know, trade flows, you know, dissipates a little bit. Let me just continue a little bit on the container side on that matter that you asked. I think a big event in the beginning of every year in, in our sector is the Chinese New Year and the slowdown of Chinese economy or the intensity of demand of the Chinese economy around that. Uh, we have been influenced by the wake, if you want, of the pandemic and uh, uh, and, the, and the return uh, to, in quotes, to normal uh, under various, uh, of the various economies, uh, we haven't seen as, dis as distinctly that seasonality play out. Uh, rates that typically are pretty weak during December and January have remained very strong. Um, the Chinese New Year is uh, uh, later... Uh, uh, later in the month, uh, I don't exactly know, it's maybe it's early February, uh, but it, um, and we expect chartering for ships to uh, to continue and to intensify right after that. So because I think of the pandemic and the unusual overall situation, I think this is on the typical seasonality pat pattern on the container side will not play out as clearly this year as in previous ones. And I guess maybe, you know, when you look at it with bookings and just for demand, I mean, you typically know 
six weeks in advance of what things are looking at, so you have sort of visibility into the maybe the end of uh, end of February this year. Is there anything different as far as customer behavior this year? And then how do you try to capitalize on that and maybe lock in what are you know above or you know contra seasonal rates? Um, Gary, you typically you know look at the forward market a lot. I think everyone does, but would you sort of comment on what you you know sort of what you see happening over the first and second quarters? Sure. Well, I definitely wasn't going to bite when you said, does anyone want to predict where, you know, uh, rates? I've been doing this for over 30 years and I know enough not to, not to, not to jump at that one. Um, I think one, one difference we have going into Chinese New Year is the directive that people not travel. It, it's, it's annually the, the biggest movement of people globally as, as people go home and, and back. And it's really disruptive to the market, particularly obviously in, in the Pacific and what's often a weak market environment anyway because of the number of new buildings that are held back from the end of the year coming in in January. And this year, we don't expect that. In fact, for instance, we have a ship we're putting into dry dock over Chinese New Year. We typically would, would avoid that, but we have you know, um, assurances, contractual assurances that the workforce is going to be there. So that, that's definitely a difference we see, we see going into it this year. Not that we don't expect there will be a uh, slow down, but we think it, it it's, could be substantially less than, than than typically. But as we look forward, I mean, I think volatility is is part of our markets, and and it's often driven around grain seasonality, right? Southern Hemisphere harvest second quarter into the third quarter, and and historically, it's the fourth quarter in, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, you know, the U.S. U.S. Uh, harvest particularly into the fourth quarter, and often carrying into into January. Um, sometimes February. So, so I don't, I don't think we're, we see seasonality going away, but we're clearly off on, on, a, on a stronger footing to start this year, which, which is helpful. And, and we also see, one thing I would comment is we're seeing people more willing to take longer forward positions, right? The period market for ships is, is, more, is more inquiry and more activity than, than there has been. I mean, if you think about the last number of years, which really unfortunately have been characterized with a lot of what I refer to as unrelated black swan type events, whether, whether we started with, you know, the, the trade wars and tariffs and Asian swine flu where China called, uh, called 150 million pigs. Um, then, then we had, you know, the Volley Dam collapse, which clearly is more effective to the Cape size and larger ships, but, but notwithstanding challenging overall. And then COVID and for Eagle in particular, with our scrubber uh, investment, the collapse of the fuel spreads on, on the basis of and we can talk about it later more, but, but the basis of, of a lack of demand in mid distillates and crude going negative for the first time ever. So, so, you know, I think all of these things, you know, put us in a different place this year, but I'm not willing to say that, that we, we aren't going to have, you know, uh, events that are going to create volatility, but I like to use the sailing analogy. We, we, we're just looking for some flat water here. Uh, as, as, you know, we, we, and I think we, the supply demand, you know, balance uh, will serve us well if we can just get some of that flat water. Yeah, I was going to throw it to Stamatis and maybe look at, you know, the strength in the Cape market. Maybe it should have happened two years ago and last year, but these black swan events, you know, had an impact and delayed it or deferred it. Can you talk about, Stamatis, what you're seeing on the demand side for, you know, the visibility for the Capes into sort of the second quarter, if you will? Yes. Well, the transportation cost is uh, always relevant to the actual cost of uh, the raw materials. Having the rally that uh, you know iron ore and coal, as far as the individual prices per ton have uh, have sustained, it's a crazy market. I mean, iron ore at its lows back in 2015, we were doing about 30 to 35 um, dollars per ton. Right now, we're doing about 170 dollars per ton of iron ore. So demand is extremely strong for iron ore, and it appears that it will continue to be so. Uh, not only because, uh, you know, the steel production countries are importing more and more quantities, but also with the fact that, uh, as I mentioned before, the infrastructure investment uh, is expected to be quite significant in the next uh, few years. So we feel that we're in the right space. I will agree with uh, Gary and everybody else that it's, uh, it's a very difficult uh, place in shipping uh, to make any sort of uh, predictions. Uh, the volatility is the key, and uh, there are always things that happen that, uh, like black swan events, that uh, unfortunately affect uh, 
our industry substantially. But right now, after uh, having experienced uh, five years of, uh, I'm not going to say pain, but um, of, of a downturn, I think that uh, we should be optimistic for the next uh, one to four years. And that's not only demand driven, but it's also supply driven. Um, we have discussed extensively about demand and how we all think that supply, sorry, demand will continue to be strong, but um, a subject that we have not touched yet, that is the supply of ships. There are various reasons why we don't see supply of additional tonnage uh, will not be an issue for the next, uh, for, for the foreseeable future at least. And that makes us very, very optimistic because uh, if you look historically at the shipping cycles, if you go back 50 years, demand is never so much of an issue. I mean, demand usually varies between half a percent to 12, 15 percent, but it's in most cases it's a positive thing. I mean, you always have positive demand for seaborne transportation services. What has ruined the parties um, in the previous cycles has always been the additional and incremental supply of ships. And that, for the first time after 15 or even 20 years, um, we don't see any uh, additional supply being an issue uh, for the foreseeable future. But, you know, we can discuss about that, uh, you know, later in today's uh, conversation. Yeah, and Mads, why don't you just talk about if you're seeing, you know, Gary alluded to it that companies are you know, making a little bit more longer term commitments. Do you see that with your customers and uh, you're, you know, you have a sort of a similar strategy of being closer to cargo than just selling time. So, you know, are you seeing customers look a little more optimistic or, you know, maybe even, you know, try to catch up a little bit just because there's so much slack in the system last year, but there might not be this year? No, I, I think that's that's definitely true. I mean, as you mentioned, we, we do have a, a little bit of a different type of um, of long term perspective on 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 the on the on the key customers of ours where we have contracts that are running five and ten years into the future, right? And you know, when we talk to them about their underlying business, it's great. Um, there's a lot of optimism, but also if you go further out than just a couple of months, you know, the 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 same uh, uncertainty and uh, that, that we're discussing here is, is, is in their business as well, right? They, they had a huge uh, shock to their operations, you know, just as everyone else last year. So, but I, I do feel that the mood has changed over the last uh, month and a half in terms of people, as, as Gary say, are, are becoming, you know, more facing that, that this is the, the market now and not just a blip. Um, but in our business, I mean, you know, seasonality used to be the business of our ship operators, right? That was what you used to. To, uh, to make your money now in our business we, we we try to limit the exposure it has on us because even you have the overall idea of seasonality you can have you know different things happening you know that goes against what you thought right so you have to be set up to manage the downside and if it goes up then that's great for everyone right um so i, I think we we have a pretty cautious uh, approach um and you know, we hope, but we cannot count on that whatever, whatever you know, favorable markets we're experiencing right now, you know, I, I would be great if we could all be physically, uh, you know, in the same room, maybe <laughs> we do this next year and, and all uh, pat ourselves on the back and what a great, what a great year we had, right? But, you know, it's unpredictable. And, and I think we all understand that, but it's, it's how do you manage it? And like I said, we manage that by, by focusing on niches where the effects of um, these uh, seasonality, uh, the seasonal, you know, uh, swings uh, are not felt as much, right? So we have a little, a more stable uh, business, I would say. But you know, um, I do agree with Gary that people are, that our customers are supplied, you know, buoyed also, of course, by the high uh, commodity prices, as the has mentioned, are also willing to accept that rates are higher now than they have been for a very long time. If, if if I could just add, you know, one of the th reasons also that people are, I think, getting more, going, you know, more more willing to commit, at least what we're seeing is, is for the last number of years there hasn't been a price to pay for not committing, right? And so, um, and and so, you know, it's only that I I think the one of the main drivers is that people see not just where where rates are today, but with they're seeing the same fundamentals we're seeing. And, and want to put themselves in a position where they can, you know, lock in, lock in, you know, costs and things like that, which is beneficial for us to be able to put some stakes in the ground in in ways other than, 
you know, using the derivative market, and that's also, you know, pushing that up. So it's all interconnected, but I agree with Matt. It's, you know, each business, each company, right, manages that uncertainty, that volatility slightly differently. And, and but, but the important thing is, I think we're all in agreement, right, that, that the, um, you know, as much as you have a view on the forward market, you know, that's not, that doesn't come with 100% certainty, and you need to be in a, in a position to uh, be able to withstand those, those shocks. Yeah, and what's been interesting to me is that, Tassos, if you would, you know, discuss the, you know, the reasons that some of your customers have locked in, you know, some of your feeders for, you know, three years at, at, at some of the highest rates that you've seen over the last five years, you know, if you could just talk about what's driving that and then potentially, you know, open it up to the, the floor afterwards about, do you see this, uh, maybe the dry bulk at some point in time seeming, seeing similar types of agreements, you know, three years or, you know, th what is it, 30 to 36 months? Um, Tassos, would you, would you illuminate what's driving those long-term contracts in the container market? First of all, let me confirm that in the container ship markets as well, the average length of a charter has more than doubled. I mean, we've seen charters or... I wouldn't say struggle, but we were uh, finding difficult to get commitments at decent rates of more than six months now, as Po indicated. We have uh, chartered a couple of our ships in uh, for two and three years, and uh, our ships are of uh, medium age on, on average, about uh, ranging from 12 to uh, 20 years old. I think what we, what I believe is happening is exactly what. Uh, uh, Gary mentioned our, our clients, our customers. In our case, it's not the end importer or the liner companies. They see the same from fundamentals that uh, that we see. The container ship market as well has one of the lowest order books for the last 20 years, perhaps even longer, although it inched up a bit in the last month, it stands at about 10%, still is way lower than what it has been as far as I remember, I think at some point it reached a hundred percent during uh, uh, the boom of uh, 2005. So I believe this is an indication that uh, liner companies see uh, demand for their own uh, uh, service and networks, and they pass down the, the, de the demand to us. It cannot be more than a pure uh, demand supply balance that they that they evaluate and are willing to commit to longer term contracts exactly to avoid paying the the cost of not committing <clears throat> so i believe it's a healthy a healthy environment emerges if you are an owner of tonnets uh, also in the containers market great do you does anyone see that potentially happening in the dry bulk market and are there any signs or any you know, indicators that would lead you to believe that, you know, might you might see that shift from a short term. I mean, sort of, a, someone characterized it to characterize it to me is, is we're switching from a just in time mode to a just in case mode where, you know, as Gary said, the cost of not having tonnage has been much lower than in the past. And maybe that change is going forward. Any indications that people are looking for you know, year or longer contracts or commitments, Stemanis? Well, it's still inexplicable to me why the major miners, um, I'm referring to the iron ore miners and the operators associated with the export of raw materials, when they know that they will need to export a given amount of um, iron ore coal for the next two years, which is in the hundreds of millions of tons, they're still reluctant to commit in periods more than, let's say, 12 to 18 months. I mean, I still do not understand it. I mean, right now, they are all so much focused in the derivatives market and what the forward trade agreements are um, indicating for the future rate. And that's the best, basically, you can get from any of these miners or major charters. I think that uh, this is going to change in the dry bulk segment because they will realize a lot of the fundamental factors that have occurred in the containers will occur again in the dry bulk market, especially starting from the bigger size 
all the way down to um, the final size or even the smaller ships where supply is very limited, demand will continue to be strong, and when they realize that this uh, is pretty much the same like the container market, they will rush into committing for longer periods um, in dry bulk, which is going to be very beneficial for all of us. And I expect that to happen in the second half of 2021, where we will start to see longer charter periods for dry bulk that are not associated with the forward um, freight agreements, but they will be associated with the actual supply chain as it is with the containers. Yes, Matt. Yeah, I mean, I think um, when when we talk to our customers, industrial customers, so that's both miners and uh, you know uh, utility companies and, um, and steelmakers, for instance, is that the way that the underlying commodities are being traded has also changed. You used to make a supply contract for a year, and then you would fix your your freight for a year, and that was a done deal. Now, as um, you know, the, the 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 futures market for the commodities is also impacting our business as ship owners. So our business as a ship owner and operator, it's actually not that complicated. It's really important that you understand your customer's business and what is it that your customers want, right? You can't try to make what you would like fit to their model. That's a, a, a fundamental, um, you know, view in, in Pangea at least. And I we can see that outside our niches or our sort of more integrated services offerings, longer contracts, and when say longer, I mean, that's that's more than, let's say, 12 months, they are hard to get because there's simply a lack of visibility on the customer side in terms of what are their needs going to be. So when they are when they are buying on an index, they would also like to have freight on an index, which is sort of uh, which means doing it in the spot market. So we find that if you don't have that little bit extra uh, in terms of a, of, a, of, a, of a niche market or, or a service that you're offering, it becomes very transactional and it becomes, you know, price is always important, of course, but you would like to have a dialogue with your customers that are that extends above just the cost of the of the freight, right? That's what we see. So, yes, short-term people are accepting that that uh, it's a different freight situation. But I still think, for the not talking time charters, uh, but for 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 contracts, COAs with 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 industrial uh, counterparts, they are st the the fundamental changes in the way those commodities are being traded uh, have impacted shipping, and we need we need to find a way to deal with that. And that's just except that's just what it is. We would all like very long, high-paying contracts, but they are very, very hard to get. Yeah. And maybe, Gary, if you would just expand on, you know, what you're, you know, you sort of started with saying people are looking for longer trip commitments. Do you, do you think that, you know, we can see year, two-year contracts in the dry bulk market? And then maybe um, sort of as a segue into the supply side, if you'd start off the, the supply side and just say, you know, do you see any of the conditions changing for, you know, that have caused supply to be so low? Sure. Um, on the first one, um, I echo Matt's view, right, his sentiment, and that is the business has changed and our customers are doing things on a spot basis and they can hedge and, 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 the, and, the, and the end users can, can hedge those commodity prices without committing and, and, and actually part of their business is doing that, right? It is that variability and the arbitrage. And so I don't necessarily see that you can end up with very long-term contracts, a, a, a huge uptick with the end users, but operators are a big part of our business and they will take, um, you know, ships for a longer period of time. And it always, it always, it may be driven by the fundamentals, but it's always going to be related to the futures market because if you trade in, in both the physical and the derivative market, whether for hedging or for for um, speculative purposes, and, and we we do it on, only for hedging purposes, but we do it dynamically. We will put hedges on and off because of those dislocations. But ultimately, these markets are highly correlated, right? The index is based on a basket of routes on a given day, and then and then and then the forward. So people who can buy the futures market for a year at a significant discount to the physical will do that, and and so there has to be a correlation between the two. Um, you know, so, so you know, I, I think we'll see an increase, but I don't think it will be a wholesale with the end users going and taking ships long term because that doesn't, to Matt's point, that doesn't fit their, their business. Um, on the supply side, you know, I think I mentioned, you know, I don't think we can credit, you know, the ship owning community for, with restraint. You know, people often ask me, have ship owners finally found religion? And I said, I, I say, I don't know if they found it, but maybe it's been foisted upon them for, at least for their, 
foreseeable future. I mean, first of all, our market's dominated by private companies, um, small private companies, and many have found ways to get through the last few years, but it's been a challenging period and the balance sheets just aren't there. Um, financing in dry bulk has really uh, changed dramatically. There's been a real pullback of many banks that used to lend in dry bulk, and it's really moved from an individual ship financing kind of project finance basis to more of lending on a corporate basis, which doesn't lend itself to that small owning model, and therefore uh, many owners have found themselves needing to turn to alternative, read more expensive financing. And then I also mentioned the uncertainty around future regulations. I mean, the average um, scrapping age for a mid-sized dry bulk ship has been 25 years historically, 25, 26 years. Um, well, there's a good chance that a ship ordered today uh, may not be able to trade in 10 or 15 years based on carbon emissions regulations or, or that the carbon levies, carbon taxes, whatever you want to call them, will be so great that the ship becomes economically unviable without massive investment. So there are people who are who are not ordering for that uncertainty, and then on, and then you have companies like ourselves who have simply said that supply has been the problem for dry bulk, and we're not going to be part of that. Uh, you know, I, I like the saying, "Ever no snowflake ever feels responsible for the avalanche," right? But but you know, if 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 every owner orders one or two ships, we're going to continue to have a supply problem. Right now, we have it's been really one of the silver linings. And 2020, if ever there was a year of silver linings, one of the silver linings of of the challenging market is that they've been re really limited ordering. And I often, I'm going a little long, but I'll wrap it up here. You know, one of the questions I often get is, you know, do you see, you know, a, a big change in, a, in an ordering of a lot of ships? And for the reasons I mentioned, I don't. Uh, the only thing I think that would elicit a significant supply side response is, is a robust freight environment for a sustained period of time. And, and I think if that happened, we're in a totally different environment because of the operational leverage of these companies. You know, then then as an investor, the equity and the, and the debt, you know, investor, um, you know, thesis will have played out significantly before those ships get ordered, in, 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 and and it's really a year and a half to two years before they start coming in in any meaningful um, meaningful uh, manner. So sorry, so, I went there. So Gary, rates would have to be high for a year, do you think? Or do you think people would order in advance of potentially well, that? You know, I, everyone makes their own investment decisions, but I think it would have to be more than a couple months. And again, then you're at a year and a half to two years before any real number of ships start coming in. And, and so you know, I, I'm hopeful that other owners you know, see it as we see it. Um, and I think actually the secondhand market is a more attractive investment, notwithstanding the fact that you're adding to the supply by ordering ships, but we, we you know, we just acquired three vessels uh, in, in the last month, uh, very modern scrubber fitted ultramaxes, and and we think that those are much more attractive given the the values we were able to pick them up at relative to a new building cost today. And these are these are you know efficient high spec modern ultramaxes. Yeah, Stamatis, did you have any um, additional comments, or it looked like you might have signaled that you? Well, I agree 100%. I think that uh, given the price differential between a new building ship and a second-hand high-quality um, ship is so big that uh, nobody in his right mind is going to start making any new building uh, orders today. Um, as far as the capes are concerned, the five-year-old cape is in the high 20s million dollars, whereas a new building is in excess of 50 million dollars. So both ships effectively make the same amount of money on a daily basis. So like Gary said and everybody else, I think it's going to be a while before we see, uh, unless there's a big stability in period employment uh, and higher period rates, I don't really think why can someone uh, invest in a new building today where, uh, number one, it may as well be redundant in a few years, like Gary said, and number two, it doesn't make any financial sense. Also, have in mind that um, a very important point that uh, people tend to neglect is that with the new environmental regulations uh, from now until 2030 and starting from 2022 and 2023 onwards, the only way that you can reduce the greenhouse emissions from the ships is to actually slow down. There's no other way. So every year from 2022 to 2023 and onwards, the global fleet will have to slow down by anywhere between half a knot to three knots. 
depending on the type of the ship, which means that there's going to be a humongous deficit of tonnage into the market to transport the same quantity of cargoes. So the fundamentals are very, very strong. There are no ways uh, right now to um, fix this deficit. So if the demand remains the same, the actual supply gap that is going to be created by the environmental regulations is going to be so big that we think that our market is going to benefit a lot. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, um, thank you, Paul. Uh, just quickly here, and, and I and I think I think for the first time today, I'm maybe happy that we're not in the room together because I I, as I think the only uh, company here with new buildings on order actually I I maybe would have uh, dodged uh, Gary sends the matches a little bit, but no, the, uh, you know we, we share the, the the outlook on the um, on the on the supply um, being curved. I, I think our ships are. Uh, uh, you know, ordered with a with a COA, a ten year COA behind them. Uh, they are not uh, sort of a, a speculative play on on the market. They are highly specialized uh, ice class vessels. Um, but but also, I think you know, we talked earlier about commodities, right? The price of steel has doubled, maybe in I don't know, eighteen months, right? That that does that is the most uh, contributing factor to the cost of building a ship. That's the price of steel. So, in Yes, a, a, a spot market that right now is, 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 is positive, you know. What we also talked about is the lack of sort of longer term commitments from charters or operators who are willing to, to support a financial investment by providing a five year charter or a five year contract. Makes it a lot harder for, for, for people to, to venture into that um, new building. It is, it is a huge risk for all the usual reasons. And then in addition, you have um, the new regulations in terms of uh, of, of, of limiting um, you know uh, greenhouse gas emissions and these things makes it not something you do uh, as um, as quickly and a decision you reach as easily as it was uh, years ago. This part is also becoming much more uh, convoluted and, and difficult to, to get a grip on. But uh, in certain circumstances, with the right kind of in our case at least contract contractual backing that that provides uh, uh, you know a a protection from the from the downside risk, you know, it, it might make sense, but it is it is not um, something we foresee either in large uh, scale on conventional types on it. No. Yeah, I, I just want to acknowledge Matt's comment, right? Because I think there is a big difference between ordering a specialized ice class high specification vessel against a ten year contract versus ordering a you know a standard you know dry bulk vessel that really, to Stamatis's point, is no different than the ship that's five years old, except you're you're investing much more money for almost identical cash flows. So so you know that that's a different business, um, and and really it's not the it's not the uh, incremental you know uh, unique high, like ice class or or gantry box hold open hatch ship things like that that we're talking about. It, it it's really the 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 standard bulk carriers in, in all the sizes. I think that's really been problematic for for us going backwards, you know, looking backwards. Okay. And when you, um, when we're sort of looking at that, um, the supply side and, and you know, potentially uh, the reasons for the order book being so low, I um, mean, all of you have been fairly active in one way or another in the, the resale market. Can you just talk about sort of the tone of, you know, who's, why are people selling? We know you guys are buying because you want to, you know, renew your fleets and lower the average age and try to, you know, enhance the fleet value. But can you just talk about sort of the M&A market or the resale market right now and sort of where we are and what kind of activity you think will happen in 2021? And then also, you know, what your banks or your, your you know, financiers are telling you as far as the ability to finance any transactions. Should, should I start and um, sure, Tessas. Perhaps uh, I should uh, preface uh, my my comments by saying that there is the difference between the dry bulk and the containers market. One of the differences is that while the, the dry bulk market is Trump shipping, container containerized trades are scheduled shipping, and that is the reason that you can get longer term contracts more more easily uh, from from the liner companies. And perhaps that's the reason that new building orders might come earlier, especially from the liner companies, because they want to be able to secure the supply of vessels for their network of, of services. Uh, in, 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 container, in the container sector, 
prices have increased significantly uh, on the back of the very strong rates. So we've seen the prices of our ships and uh, I wouldn't say double, but increase by as much as 70%. So that gave the opportunity to many trapped financial investors, especially in container shipping that were trying to exit over some period of time to find a good opportunity to exit. I know of at least two or three cases where they were able to uh, divest of the fleet. Uh, that was the opportunity that they really uh, were waiting for a decade uh, or, or so. At the same time, the ability to uh, have, to, to conclude a long-term contract might make a well-thought investment of buying a ship worthwhile today. As if you back up an acquisition with a credible uh, medium term to long term contract, it might make sense to buy quality units even at a relatively higher point in the cycle. That is the, the story in general on the container ship uh, uh, sector. It's more of a seller's market, it's definitely a seller's market. And um, it's an opportunity to capitalize to some extent, to, to a great extent, on the run up of the prices. On the dry bulk market, we believe that we are. Uh, not yet, where the, the cycle, the, up, the upward part of the, side, of the cycle is starting now. So we feel that there are opportunities and time to invest uh, in quality units. Uh, and I guess second-hand investment is probably a much better proposition these days, given all the emissions and regulatory concerns that uh, exist out there. Great. Anyone else? Or yeah, Mats, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, just uh, maybe a little bit on, on the on the financing. I mean, I, I think our our banks, the ones we talk to, um, you know, they they are they are conservative, and they always have been, and and, and probably even more so now than than for the you know last 10, 15 years. They are they are also looking at I think and value companies that understand and and manage the downside of the business. What's the risk if not everything? Goes according to the, you know, to your to your models and your spreadsheets, right? You know, um, they're looking for that, so they're looking for companies who are conservative. And also, um, you know, we haven't talked a lot about it today, but 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 the ESG uh, part of our business is also becoming uh, more and more important, and, and and we are actively working with banks who are providing financing under the Poseidon principles that that put some uh, sort of. Um, requirements on us and our business and how we report and we just uh, published our, our first ever ESG report um, and you know these are, they come for, for I think for well capitalized well run companies their opportunities are there for the good projects so all of those who are, who are present on this call I, I think uh, you know being a public company is a huge advantage when you are when you're dealing with uh, with uh, with financiers both in um, in Europe and US and, and also, for instance, in Japan, um, that, that, that it's another part of the business that is actually a competitive advantage. So, but these questions and the, the, the demands on us and how we run our business and how we report ESG is only going to get um, higher. And I think that's great because I think a company that, that operates safely, environmentally friendly, uh, ultimately will be more profitable. So I think that's a push that's happening now. So yeah, difficult financing for, for private companies, I think as Gary mentioned, but, but that's an opportunity for, for, for those of us on this call, for instance. Yeah, great. Well, I think we're, we're close to wrapping up, but I wanted to sort of give everyone an opportunity to sort of, you know, from our view, the supply demand balance looks durable. Uh, orders are gonna take, you know, 12 to 18 months to come through. You know, it doesn't seem like the incentives or the financing uh, is there as far as seeing the type of supply increase that, that you know, would overwhelm the, you know, recovery and demand, especially if there's no black swan event this year. But when you sort of look at it, what do you, how do you prepare for, you know, the challenges ahead? It seems like the challenges may not be supply and demand, but they may be may be more regulatory or invent, environmental. And you know, we got through post, uh, we're in post IMO 2020. What, what do you see as the big challenge out there? Is it, is it a, dealing with the emissions regulations that are coming down the pike or what, what could be the sort of the, the biggest challenge looking forward? 
Yeah, maybe I'll start. I mean, I think first of all, it, it's it's about being being out there and aware and 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 really kind of in the forefront of understanding, you know, what those requirements are. I mean, Stamatis mentioned that, you know, I think he said the only way, but one of the ways to comply with, with 20, 20, you know, uh, the, the targets as we go towards 2030 is slowing down. There's also a number of other things. We've been, we, we spend a lot on low friction, you know, ablating um, hull coatings. We've, we've invested in pre- and post swirl appendages. We're partnering with a number of different firms on, on advanced weather routing uh, systems, things like that, that all are part of lowering emissions. And the good thing about all these things is they're also good for business, right? They're good business case investments because lower emissions means lower fuel costs, you know, higher speeds and, and more efficiency and things like that. So, and it's about being aware. I mean, Matt's mentioned the Poseidon principles, which we have financing of that as well. You know, we as a company are also members of the Getting, Getting to Zero Coalition, which is a collaborative effort of the industry to um, advance the interest of getting to zero emissions, which is a huge undertaking, um, you know, in the IMO 2050 targets. Um, and, and, you know, also, also, you know, doing the things that, you know, are, are important across the ESG spectrum. Um, you know, it was governance for a long time. Um, environment is, is, of course, you know, front and center now. And which is important, and there's also the social aspect. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm proud to say of, on the Weber ESG scorecard, Eagles rated number one out of 52 public companies. And and again, it speaks to the fact that you know it's about what it's also good for business, right? That that companies with high ESG, um, it's good for investors. So I think it's really about being there, keeping your eyes open. We don't know what's around. Well, we know some things that are around the corner, but not everything. But it's about being being you know aware of it and and. And proactively engaging uh, to, to take advantage of these challenges or our opportunities and give you an opportunity for competitive advantage and that's how we look at it. Yeah. Stamatis, what do you think the biggest challenge is right now? Well, I agree first of all with uh, Gary um, in a number of ways. Um, I think that the environmental regulations going ahead uh, uh, will be a big challenge, not because um, not because of the actual effect, but uh, because of the uncertainty. We don't know what the fuel of tomorrow is going to be. We don't know what the engines of tomorrow will be. And this is an industry that, from an engineering point of view, it hasn't really changed for the last 30, 40, or even 50 years. I mean, the engine is pretty much the same as it has been 30 or 40 years ago with various improvements in electronics. But at the end of the day, the propulsion and everything else is pretty much the same. So we need to be sure what the engine of tomorrow is going to look like, what the fuel of tomorrow is going to look like, and what the allowed emissions of tomorrow are going to look like, and how we will all meet these targets. For the time being, we need to be very, very cautious, and we need to be concerned for the future of the industry in order not to repeat uh, the previous mistakes that um, some players did in the last 10, 15 years, and we enter again into a period of low rates. We need to be cautious and we're going to be concerned about the future of the industry. I would like to add also that in 2020, Sorry, 2020 it wasn't really the, uh, the environmental and scrubber issues that became the challenges, but some simpler ones like crew replacement and taking care of simple operational matters that define the, the challenges of, of last year for most of us. Great. Mads, any comment on challenges? Or Sure, I mean, I, I think um, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of not a very visible, um, you know, pathway forward on the ESG, but it actually is the way we approach this is this is an opportunity for us. This will set apart uh, the high quality companies, the, the quality, the companies that can act proactively in the market and, and make uh, and make good decisions for not just the next quarter, but but to be a good, you know, company for, for the long term. Right. And I think so that and you know, just to bring up something else here, so I think the social part of our business, uh, the the work that we have to do in our business on, on, on getting our message out there, especially for younger people to improve our focus on the good corporate governance, as Gary said, but also especially diversity and, and how do we bring in a more wider, uh, you know, background of people into the business. Um, uh, those those are areas where I think for, for our partners in shipping, at least we have not been very good and, and our customers are leading that change. We have to adapt as well um, to, to more mirror the, the world around us. So it's not just guys who look like uh, the five of us on this call who uh, 
who uh, who are uh, attending the Noble uh, Noble Twenty Seven or something like that. Hopefully, there will yep. be fresh faces here. Well, with that, I want to wrap up, and I want to thank all of you for participating, and I look forward to hearing the company presentations of the next two days. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye.